John chapter 10. The Gospel of John chapter 10. We're thankful to be in the service this morning. Glad to see each one that's here with us. If you're visiting with us, we thank you so much for coming to be with us in the service this morning. Again, we're going to be reading from John chapter 10. We'll begin reading in verse 22. John chapter 10, verse 22. We had an opportunity to go over to County Line uh, Friday night station. Had met with them Wednesday night. That's why I was here uh, early. And then I uh, had the opportunity to go over there Friday night and Brother Joe would preach the message, and I'm not about to try to re-preach the message. Brother Joe preached, but there was one statement he made that kind of stood out to me, and uh, as, as I typically do, I'm trying to find a pen to write something down because I can't remember anything. And uh, I've, I've just had that, ever since then, I've had that idea on my heart. I want to try to feel like that's what the Lord would have me to, to preach. It goes right along with some things that I've had on my heart for a while. And uh, I, I don't know if maybe somebody here is struggling with the idea of salvation, but the Lord has had me and uh, some things on my heart to do, the I guess, the best that I can with words to try to clarify the idea of salvation and how simple that it is. I'm not going to say that salvation is easy, okay? I want you to hear me clearly. I'm not going to say that salvation is easy. The Bible says that it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for some people to enter into the kingdom of God. Salvation is difficult, and the reason that salvation is difficult is because we make it difficult, because we fight it and we try to do it ourselves. That's our nature. But salvation is so simple and so easy in that we don't have to do anything for it have to do absolutely nothing for it now i've said a lot and i want to explain all of that this morning again i want to go with the idea that i I preached maybe a few weeks ago the idea of what does the lord expect from me maybe you find that in in uh in in desperation maybe you find that that you've you've been to that place you maybe the lord's shown you you lost You've, you've you've tried to, to be saved you've tried to pray you've tried to do you know whatever and, and you know you just you, you can't for whatever reason you, you can't be saved and you find yourself where you're confused this morning I want to try to talk to you for a moment I want to try to unmuddy the waters and clear the waters if I can to show you how simple it is to be saved and exactly how the process works is the best that I can uh, I think of the statement that's made uh, to the, Paul by the Philippian jailer there in Acts chapter 16. He said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And he said, believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And thou, may, thou mayest be saved. Thou and thine house is what he says. In other words, it's not just good for you. It's good for everybody in your house. It's good for all of you. And it'll work for every one of you. Uh, salvation, again, we, you, you probably have heard some terms that preachers have used. They preach a different message, you know, kind of surrender is one of those terms I'm going to use quite a bit this morning, the idea of giving up. Uh, and, and, and what that means is, you know, I've, 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 I've tried. It. Salvation is a, is a seeking mercy from God. And so you say, well, I've, I've tried. I've tried to get saved. And as long as you're trying, you're trying to do it yourself. Salvation is a surrender because there is nothing you can do to be saved. Salvation is looking to God to do that for you in complete faith, knowing who he is. And that is a surrender. That is surrendering. Stop fighting. We have a tendency to battle things. We have a tendency to battle the truth. This morning, if you're here and lost, I want you to understand something. And maybe you're a church member. And maybe you've been running from the truth. We have a tendency to do that and just push it away. And you say, well, I I remember when I got baptized, but you've never trusted the Lord. This morning, don't run from the truth. It's better to humble yourself. It's better to humble yourself and admit the fact that you're lost and get it right with the Lord than rather be a church member and spend your eternity in hell. It's better to go ahead and humble yourself today before the Lord than to humble yourself at judgment and still spend eternity in in hell this morning don't run from the truth 
surrender to it, accept it. And this morning, that's kind of some of the things that we want to discuss as we look at the scripture this morning. John chapter 10, I want to begin reading in verse 22. And it was at Jerusalem, the feast of the dedication, and it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. There's a lot in there that we're going to discuss. Verse 25, Jesus answered them, I told you, and you believed not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you believe not, because you're not of my sheep. As I said unto you, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I'll give unto them eternal life. And they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man shall be able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. I'm going to stop reading there with verse 30. Uh, again, there's a lot that, that is being said here, especially by these men that have come to the Lord Jesus Christ. You've got a mixed multitude. The Bible just d describes them as Jews. Uh, probably some Pharisees, there may be some Sadducees involved, some scribes. There may be just some common folks that were none of it in class. It may be just a common group of people, and that's why John would describe them as just Jews. There were some that came there. And so what was their motive in coming to Jesus and asking this? I, I don't know. Probably each individual heart would be in a different condition, and each individual heart would be in a different scenario. There may have been some there that were sincere, and they really wanted to know who Christ was. There were Maybe there were some, and they've seen some of the things that's happened, and they've, they've wondered about Christ. They've wondered of who he was, and they're, they're searching for the true identity. Is Jesus really the Christ? Is this man from Nazareth really the one? And so they're, they're battling with this idea. On the other side, you've got probably some that were there that they didn't want Jesus to be the Christ. They were battling again. Same idea. They're battling with it. But they're not wanting Jesus to be the Christ because Jesus is not who they expected him to be. We know that the Jews had been looking for the Christ to come. There were probably other Christs. There's going to be, the Bible tells us that there will be other people who claim to be Christ is what the Bible's telling us. But they're not. But they're struggling with Jesus. And one of the reasons they're struggling with Jesus is exactly what he tells them. You don't believe in me. And the works that I do bear witness of the fact of who I am. The works, and that's one of the reasons they're watching Jesus do these miracles. And this, this man's got to have power from somewhere to be able to do the things that he's doing. How can we claim that this man is not the Christ and him having the ability that he has? So they're struggling with it. And so they're asking Jesus to tell us, who are you? Tell us plainly. Don't make us doubt anymore. Tell us who you are. And they're stumbling over this fact. One of the reasons is, is because the Jews were not expecting the Christ to be a man of a lowly stature. They weren't expect, expecting a servant. They weren't expecting somebody who would come and just, you know, the, the statement was made, can any good thing come from Nazareth? They certainly weren't expecting him to come from Nazareth because Nazareth was not the, the, the common place of prosperity and uh, of of popularity and and so they were not expect they expected Christ to be of the characteristic of being a popular man one who would be born of royal blood one who would be rich one where he'd be a good looking fellow and Jesus was none of those things and Jesus said, so they weren't looking for deliverance from their sins because they needed they didn't need that they, so they thought they keep the law, and, and the law was their, their deliverance from sin. They, they, they stumbled over the fact that, that Jesus Christ had come not to deliver them from Roman oppression, but to deliver them from their sinful state. And so they were stumbling over this fact. They were stumbling over the fact of who he was. And that he was not who they expected him to be. You know, there's a lot of times we can stumble over the fact that things are not as we expected them to be. And they say, you know, there's, there's been quite a few people who have stumbled over the idea of being lost. They say, well, I expected something to happen for the Lord to tell me. Well, it's just a burden in your heart. 
It's just that simple. It's just a burden in your heart. And the Lord that's just letting you know that something's issue. There's something wrong. Something between me and you is not fixed. It's a simple burden. And there have been quite a few who have stumbled over that and, and battled with it for years, not thinking that they were in a lost condition, yet the whole time being lost and being under conviction for sin. Don't stumble over things and don't have a preconceived idea of what it's going to be like. Because at the end of the day, you don't really know and those preconceived ideas will do nothing but make you stumble if you're not very careful. And that's what they were doing with Christ. They already had in their mind of what he was supposed to be like and since Christ didn't meet that standard that they had set, not biblically, Christ met everything biblically, but he didn't meet the standard of what they had set in their own mind. They stumbled over him. And so they asked him this question. If, if thou, and then they asked him, you notice this. He said, how long, how long dost thou make us to doubt? How long are you going to make us to doubt? Tell us, uh, as he said, if thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. If, you're, if you are who you say you are, tell us who you are. And as, you know, as, as if that would... I don't think that would have helped anyway. I mean, if Jesus would have made the statement to them, okay, I am the Christ. Do you think he, they would have believed him just because he said the words? They were looking for proof. That's what they were looking for. I want you to hear me this morning. They were asking the Lord, don't make us have faith. That's what they were saying. You've given us a reason to doubt. And now it's to the case that if we're going to believe that you are the Christ, then we've just got to accept that. Don't know. Show us who you are. Don't make us have faith. And so often that's where people stumble in salvation is because they're, they're saying, well, don't make it. Give me proof. I want proof that you're the Christ. I want proof that you've done this. I want proof that you've done that. Don't make us have faith. Faith and proof are two different things. Look at the evidence. Look at the evidence this morning. And so maybe you've come in frustration and desperation and you've, you've tried. Maybe you've prayed today. And those prayers have gone unanswered. Let me just say this while we're here. There are two kinds of people who have never been saved. Two kinds just that simple there are two kinds of people who do who have never been saved those who do not want to be saved and those who do not need to be saved this morning do you want to be saved secondly do you need to be saved you've got to have both of those this morning if you're hearing lost I want you to know something. I've been praying for you. I've been concerned about you. If I know your condition this morning in the church, I want you to know something. I drove to Station Creek this morning crying and calling your name to the Lord because I'm concerned about you. But are you concerned of yourself? Are you concerned about where you will spend eternity? Are you concerned about your condition with the Lord? This morning, these people were, were looking at this situation with Christ. They were asking Him, how long are you going to make us doubt? They're looking for a king. Even the disciples were caught up in that. If you look at Acts chapter 1, after Jesus' resurrection, they asked Christ, are you going to now set up the kingdom? Jesus goes on to tell them, it's not, in, it's not my, in, in, in your power to know the times and the seasons that God set and appointed in his time, in his way. God will establish the kingdom when he gets ready to establish the kingdom. Until then, you surrender to him. Let's go a little bit further. They made this statement, if, here. That's what I want to narrow it down to. If is a conditional Statement. The word if literally means the introduction or the introducing of a conditional clause. If thou be the Christ. 
And it leaves open the fact that it may not be the case. If thou be the Christ, well, there's a chance in their minds that he's not the Christ. They're not believing. It's a conditional clause. So they've heard the rumors. They've heard of Christ. They've seen the miracles that have been performed. And now they're trying to figure this thing out. How can he be Christ? We don't understand the situation. We don't understand what's going on here. There's, it's, it's obvious that they don't understand it. And they're asking if thou be the Christ. We want to know. But we want to know and we want to if, if maybe, maybe that's sincere. Maybe there were some that were there that said, if he is the Christ, I want to know it so I can serve him. But it was all based on the condition that I'll serve him when you give me the proof that I need. And it's not that I'm just going to surrender to him. So there again, in frustration, they say, well, what does God expect of us? The, God, the Lord expects unconditional, unconditional surrender. You cannot surrender to the Lord with conditions. And so often people stumble and people fail and people get misunderstood and, and confused right there. It's because the prayers are, Lord, if I'm saved, show me this. Lord, if, if you will save me or if you will show me this, I'll believe or help me to see this. Or give me proof and I'll take you. Give me proof. How long are you going to make us to doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly so that we can believe in you. All that's asking for is don't make me have faith. That's, that's, that's simply what it said. Don't make me have faith. I want to give you a couple of conditional state, statements in the Bible. And then I'm going to turn to some places where we, or, or, or probably not turn, I'll just mention them to me, a time or two in the Bible where there is the true surrender like what God expects from you. The first thing that I want you to, to notice and I want you to think about with me for a moment, and, and I really, I, 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 this, is, this is not about salvation, obviously, because we're going to be talking about Jesus Christ, but I want you to see the conditional statement and then the unconditional surrender with Jesus Christ. I want you to see both of those. When Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed. And one of the things that Jesus was, as he was praying, he was uh, he, he was very nervous, sweat of great drops of blood. He knew what was coming. Not only the physical pain of the cross, but the being separated from the Father. All of that was coming. And Jesus began to pray. And he said, if it be possible, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Now what was Jesus asking for? He's saying that if there is another way, if there is the possibility that salvation could come through another means, don't let me drink this cup of your wrath. That's what Christ is asking. And it's a conditional statement. It's based upon the condition that there's possible that a salvation, that salvation could come through another means. Now I want to back up for a moment. That in itself should let us know that salvation's always been by one means. One way. Because there's people that claim, well, in the Old Testament, salvation was this way. Or in the Old Testament, people got saved by the law. And they did this, or they did that, or they kept the law. Or there's some kind of thing that happened. And Jesus said, if there be another way, if it be possible. Let me ask you this question. If salvation was some other way in the Old Testament, do you think God would have let His Son get killed? No, salvation would have been that way. In fact, that's exactly what the writer of Hebrews says in chapter 8. Salvation would have come through that means. And Jesus is saying, if there is some other way, let this cup pass from me. Jesus introduced a condition. But Jesus bypassed that condition. And he said, nevertheless, nevertheless, that means regardless if it's that way or not. 
thy will be done. Whatever you have for me. Jesus presented a condition in his request. And then he said, regardless of whether this comes true or this is the case or not, your will be done. Your will be done. Jesus surrendered to the Lord without condition. He surrendered completely and unconditionally. I want to go to another one. There was another man that made a statement to the Lord when they put him on the cross. Later, they crucified him. They made the statement to Christ. They would say, if thou be the Christ, come down from the cross. We'll believe you. The thief on the cross made the statement that if thou be the Christ, come down from the cross, save thyself and us too. If you are the Christ, it's based on a conditional statement. You can see the lack of faith even in the statement itself. How often do we try to bargain with God? We try to offer Him something. If you are the Christ, if you save us and when I get home, let some kind of thing be some certain way and then I'll know that you did it. The Lord don't work that way. You're going to find desperation and frustration. That's what you're going to find. Because you're still fighting. You're presenting conditions to the Lord. Brother Steve made a statement the other day that made a lot of sense to me. I think it was the general of the United States. I may have some of these confused a little bit, but the, the point still applies. I think it was the general of the United States when Japan surrendered to World War II. They made their peace agreement. And when they went, the, 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 the man, the Japanese general, extended his hand to shake the hand of the United States general, and the, the United States general said, I cannot, I cannot take your hand until you first surrender your sword. In other words, I'm not, we can't make a deal till you quit fighting. You've got to surrender. You've got to give up. You've got to let go. And then you have the other thief that just said, remember me when you come in. And he just sought mercy. Remember me when you come in. Come in coming out of that kingdom. I want giving you kind of a couple of things about the conditions. I want to give you one about unconditional. I want you all to think about the prodigal son for a moment. You all know the account of the prodigal son very well. He took everything that his father gave him. And he went into a far country and he wasted it on riotous living. He lived how he wanted to. And that got him to the place where he would join himself to a citizen of the country and he was feeding the swine and he was so hungry and he had absolutely nothing. He was so hungry that he had, he desired to eat the, the, the slop that he was given the pigs. That's how hungry he was. He had nothing, nothing. And he said, I know what I'll do. He came to himself, I know what I'll do. I'm going to go back to my father's house. I'm going to go back home. And when he, when he gets back home, what does he say? He doesn't tell his father what his father should do for him. He doesn't, he doesn't tell his father how things need to be. He doesn't proclaim that he is a son and his father should forgive him in all of that manner. He has nothing to offer his father at all. Nothing. Even to the point that he says, I am no more worthy to be called thy son. I've got nothing to give you. I've got no condition that I can make. I cannot make any condition at all because I'm absolutely nothing. Let me ask you all if you're saved. Do you ever feel that way? A bit emotional this morning. I'll tell you the truth. There's been some things the Lord has just been watching the Lord's hand work and lining some things up. And sometimes when I'm looking at it and I'm thanking the Lord and I'm praying and I'm thanking the Lord for the things that he's doing, I've been just waiting almost for the rug to get draw, jerked out from under me. And the reason is, is because I know who I am. 
and I have nothing to offer God. I have nothing to give Him. People often look at preachers and they, they automatically assume that you're a preacher because you're trying to sway with the Lord or you're trying to get something out of life or something of that nature. I don't preach because of uh, to, to get something from God. I preach because of what God's already given me. And to be straight up honest with you, I drive into church this morning with tears coming out of my eyes. Telling the Lord, I do not know why you could love a person like me. I don't deserve you. And the Lord simply and very easily let me know it's because you still don't understand who I am and how much I love you. You do not know the depths of my goodness. This morning, I've got nothing to offer God. He didn't save me because I was a good fellow. He didn't save me because I had lived my life right. He didn't save me because I come up with the good conditions or I cried right or I said the words right. He didn't, he didn't save me for that. He saved me when I surrendered before him with nothing to offer. And I just asked him to have mercy on me. I've got nothing to give. I've got nothing to offer. I have no condition. Please have mercy on me. I'm going to get you, get, kind of get you a, a visual image of it real quick. It makes sense to me. A lot of times the Bible presents, at least the way they fought battles in these days, the Bible presents a battle scenario. And you see kind of in a valley... Right on the side, right on the edge of a mountain, you would typically have down in the valley floor, right at the edge of the mountain, you would have one army that would gather itself. And then you'd have another army that would gather itself right in the valley, and they're facing each other, and they're, they're ready to battle. Today, that's where we find ourselves. Those of us that are saved, we're on the Lord's side, and we are part of the host of the, of, of the Lord. Jesus is our captain. The Bible presents him as the captain of the host of the armies of God. On the other side, you've got the devil. And all the armies of the devil, all of those who defy the living God. And this morning, you may not like it. You may run from it and you may fight it. But if you're not saved, you're on the devil's team. Now, you may not like that. But it's the truth. Because if you're not for the Lord, you're fighting against Him. And the reason the battle is so intense and the reason that you're struggling and all that is because you're fighting God. You're fighting Him. And then the question it says, well, what am I supposed to do? Well, imagine that you're on the devil's side and you want to get to the Lord's side. What are you going to do? You're going to wave the white flag. That's what you're going to do. I'm through fighting. I'm going to go bow myself down on my knees before the captain of the host of the armies of God. And I'm going to say, I'm through. I want to be on your side. Have mercy on me. Don't kill me. Please. You don't, you don't get saved through making a deal with the Lord. You don't get saved because you've, you've done something yourself. You, 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 the salvation comes through when you surrender to the Lord and allow Him to do it for you. And it's just that simple. What the Lord expects is for you to unconditionally surrender before Him. Stop fighting. Stop trying to do it yourself. And just surrender before the Lord. Give up. And stop the fight. This morning what God expects from us, what God expects from you this morning if you're lost, is to unconditionally surrender before Him and let Him save you. Salvation again, the whole aspect, it's... Uh, kind of counterintuitive in that that 
You say, well, what am I supposed to do? Well, the thing is, there's nothing you can do. But God will do it for you if you'll surrender to him and let him. And this morning, if you'll give up and you'll surrender to the Lord, he'll save your soul while we have a verse of a song.